All right, hey everyone, how's it going? It's your brother Noah. I hope that you guys are blessed in the name of our Lord Jesus. And today what I wanted to talk about in this video that is a problem amongst many Christians commonly, and that is you try to change people in your life for the sake of evangelism, for the sake of trying to lead somebody to, to the truth, to repentance, to believe the truth, you go about trying to change that person in your own strength, in your own wisdom, in your own might. And many times you can't see past this because of the seemingly righteous approach, because of the good intentions that you have to lead somebody to repentance. But this is a problem with many Christians that they try to do so in their own strength. And they're not being led by God. They're not using discernment on who to minister to. They're ministering out of, you know, who they would like to see saved. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Many people, many Christians, and I'm going to be talking about fa family is a great example. So I'm going to be talking about family. But many Christians want people to be saved, especially those whom they are close to, a partner or family or friends even sometimes, because it would be convenient for their life. It would be convenient and good for you, for your mother to be saved. It would be convenient and good for you for your husband to be saved. So you try to, you know, lead them to repentance based on that basis, which obviously leading them to repentance is a good intention. Many people do have good intentions when they are trying to do this, but you haven't reached the level of sanctification and deliverance in your walk yet to realize that you're doing so for your own motives or when you're not led by God. I do believe there is a time to minister to people when you're led by God to do so in a certain way. There's even times, you know, I've realized in my walk where maybe I'm on a video call with somebody or I'm having a conversation with somebody and one person's a believer and the other person's an unbeliever. And I'm not even utterly trying to convince the unbeliever. I'm not utterly trying to, you know, poke and prod at this unbeliever because I could tell that they're not interested. And I'm sorry to use this example. I've used it before, but with regards to deliverance, many people will try to, you know, drag an unbelieving family member to a deliverance ministry, to a deliverance session. And that unbelieving family member is just not interested, is just not repentant. And I've said it before on my channel, guys, God meets people where they're at. But if you are just apathetic and not even open up to what God is trying to do in your life, then you're kicking against the pricks. You are trying to control your life. And, you know, many times you could actually selfishly, uh, selfishly project onto unbelievers. You could project, you know, your desires the way you want them to live. But we want people to be saved ultimately for the glory of God. We want to want people to be saved because it is the will of God, because it would advance the kingdom of God. And for the glory of God, the word of God says in the book of Revelation that all things were created for God's glory, for God's pleasure ultimately. So I think that's important to take into consideration with regards to evangelism. Are we evangelizing that the glory of God would fill the earth? I believe your way of ministering to people will look different when you take that approach as opposed to, you know, the way that you've been trying to minister maybe so far. I wanted to read some scriptures on the matter. And I, I wanted to go back to just a second when I said earlier, when I said I'm not utterly trying to convince the unbeliever. I'm not going to keep poking and prodding. You know, preach the gospel to unbelievers no matter what their heart disposition, uh, disposition is. See if they're open to a conversation, right? But, you know, many people use this statement, right? You can't shove Christianity down people's throats. You can't shove being converted down people's throats. And I realize that a lot of sinners use that statement just as an excuse to live in sin. Or, you know, many false converts use that statement just to have a lawless kind of Christianity. I realize the abuse of that statement. But in some sense, it is true, right? I found it so much more fruitful in my walk and so much more peaceable to myself. And I'm just seeing a lot more fruit in my walk since I've incorporated that. Where if somebody's like not interested in what I have to hear, 
I'm not going to push and push and put and keep pushing, right? I'll push some and see, you know, see what God will do. See if God will open their hearts. See if they're open to a conversation, right? But if they're just totally closed off, I'm going to respect that. And you know what? In turn, actually, that could really, um, you know, be impactful to them. That could actually, you know, uh, leave an impression on their heart that Christians are, you know, loving people, that Christians don't have control problems, right? It could actually be counterproductive if you keep pushing and pushing and unnecessarily offend people. And don't get me wrong, we should be passionate for souls. We should be zealous to see people come into the kingdom of God. But salvation is of the Lord. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's the Lord who brings the increase. The word of God says, some scatter, some water, uh, but God is the one who brings the increase. Many people are trying to bring the increase on their own accord, and they are unnecessarily offending unbelievers. And many people as well, too, they try to hold unbelievers to a Christian standard. They try to hold unbelievers to the st same standard of holiness that a Christian is supposed to be walking in, right? If somebody claims to be a Christian, I'm going to try to hold them to a higher standard than somebody who's an unbeliever. I totally understand that they're not doing Christian things if they're not even trying to be a Christian, right? We have to go at this from a foundational level. If they are not even foundationally in agreement with wanting to be a Christian, why are you putting stipulations on them like they should be walking like they're a Christian? Now, once again, if they claim to be a Christian, then there's totally that obligation. And I believe you can, you know, push more into the situation in that case. But I hope you guys get what I'm saying. I'll talk more about this all throughout the video. But Matthew chapter 15, verse 14 says, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying to the disciples about the Pharisees and some of the people who follow them. Let them alone. Leave them alone. Now, obviously, this is not a universally applicable statement to all unbelievers that you just leave them alone. But there is a time and a place where if they don't have an ear to hear, move on. And I want to say this as well, too. I've said it before, but a large part of my audience probably probably hasn't heard it. And that is when you're born again, God takes you out of the circle of influence that you were in, right? And puts you into a new circle of influence, Meets you, has you meet strangers that you never knew when you were living in sin. And most of the time, those are the people that you will be able to minister to a lot more effectively. Once in a while, God will have you be, uh, you know, used effectively to people that you knew before your salvation. But guys, there's just so much scripture on this topic. Jesus said, no prophet has honor in their hometown. Jesus himself said that a, a prophet is not offered, uh, is not honored amongst their kinsmen. It said that he could not do many mighty works there, except he heal a, sm a small amount of infirmities, right? So if that was the situation with our Lord Jesus Christ, then who are we to think that we can supersede that, um, we, we can override that situation? And this is commonly what I see with people that have this problem, that they're too utterly concerned about their family in the way. Now, now let me let me be careful how I say this. Let me be, you know, don't let me uh, invalidate people's love for their family because once again, a lot of people have good intentions. And should we pray for our family? Should we continually minister? I believe actually our family has a special place for us to minister to unlike just random people. But then once again, that doesn't discredit the statement that I made earlier that many times God takes you out of that sp sphere of influence of people that you knew and uses you more effectively amongst people that you never knew. Why? Because those people didn't know, don't know you as a sinner and therefore that familiarity isn't blocking your ministering from being effective to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Word of God is saying right here, to somebody who is unregenerate, to somebody who is lost, 
They do not perceive the things of the Spirit of God. So why are you hurt? Why are, and I realize, you know, but why are you receiving being hurt? Why are you, you know, utterly affected when unbelievers are not receiving the things that you have to say unto them? You want to look for the pockets of opportunity where God is moving. You know, you can see a lot of, you can see a lot of people saved. You can see a lot of people come to repentance. I see salvations. I see a lot of repentance as I minister, even yet still at the same time. Why is this the case? Because what you need to do is to align yourself with the opportunities that God is bringing across your plate, that God is bringing to your situation of the people that he's already drawing. And once you understand this, you know, you understand the sovereignty of God in salvation so much more. You know, you see somebody being used by, effectively by God. Is it because they have power or wisdom in that of themselves? No, but it's because they have learned to, in some way, shape, or form, align themselves with the opportunities where God is already leading somebody to Jesus Christ to begin with. God's already working in those people, and that minister just has the ability or the opportunity to get into those opportunities and be used by God reoccurringly, right? And this, this idea or this, uh, this approach towards ministry so debunks cessationism because cessationists say things like, oh, just go out into the hospital, go out into the graveyard and start raising people from the dead. But it's like, we cannot do things aside from the leading of God. The reason why the apostles and the disciples, you know, saw so much uh, miracles is because, once again, one of the main factors, they had the discernment to align themselves with and partner with the opportunities that God was already working in people's lives to begin with. I wanted to read another passage to you guys. Jeremiah 7 verse 8 all the way down to 16 says, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will, will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this the... Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my first name at first. See what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called unto you, but ye answer not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, unto the place which I gave unto you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, and as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore pray, not thou for these people, neither lift up a cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Wow, this is a very intense passage. There is such a point where a group of people can reach or people can reach where the Lord is saying unto Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Do not intercede for them. I will not hear intercession on their behalf. Now, obviously, this is a very extreme situation, right? Am I saying, therefore, don't pray for unbelievers? No. The Word of God actually says in the New Testament to pray for all men everywhere. The word of God says that God is willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? I'm going to bring some balance into this message, yes. But it doesn't negate an example like this in the word of God. Nevertheless, I just want you guys to be aware of this concept is the reason why I'm bringing up Jeremiah chapter 7 right here. You know, that uh, there's, there's, there's an instance where, you know, somebody has sinned so horrendously to the point where, you know, the Lord's saying don't intercede for them. Now, there's a difference between somebody being like a Saul that's out in the world that hasn't come to the knowledge of God, as opposed to somebody that God has called, 
you know, it's saying right here that the Lord did speak unto these people repetitively. And they, so they intentionally ignored conviction. And if you're in a state right now where you're in sin and you've ignored conviction, I'm not trying to heap condemnation on you. If you repent, you can receive forgiveness most definitely. But this reminds me of, uh, you know, many people that are constantly like, you know, talking about all these celebrities and they're coming to God. And, you know, I just think so many times people are deceived by this. People are just being hoodwinked by this. And could a situation like this possibly be the case where those people have done such wicked evil and repetitively ignored God's conviction that they're given up in such a fashion? I think that could be an example where that's the case, right? So I'm not trying to, you know, discourage people from evangelizing but you can evangelize by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can evangelize as led by God. You can evangelize with the opportunities that God is bringing across your path. Guys, when you're out there ministering, when you're ministering to people, if you look for the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you. Nope, don't talk to that person. They're just a mocker and they're a scoffer. And ignoring them will actually not give them the attention that they want and and then God can convict them more as opposed to you yelling at them and fighting with them. And you're out evangelizing and then there's another person and God says, go pray for this person or go talk to this person, right? I hope you guys are get what I'm trying to say, that we need to be led by the Holy Spirit, right? We need to be led by the Holy Spirit in all of these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then must he needs to go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, a co or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one not to eat, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. I've read this scripture in various videos before, but I think a lot of the church has this backwards, where a lot of people, especially on the internet nowadays, making content, are scrutinizing worldly celebrities, scrutinizing, you know, these, uh, the, yeah, these worldly people in high places, right? But it, and, and not taking accountability for people who claim to be Christian. That because they're Christian, we, we can't rebuke them or it's, it's causing division inherently or something like that. But it's actually the other way around. It's right here, guys. It says, them that are without, God judges. For what have I to do to judge them that are within? That's what, or, or them that are without. Do ye not judge them that are within? Paul is saying that you should rather judge people that claim to be Christians than people that are out in the world. If people are out in the world, I understand where they're coming from because they haven't had their eyes open to the knowledge of the truth. And yes, I mean, you know, the word of God does say in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, for example, for the times of ignorance God, uh, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There is that accountability, yes, in some sense, that all men are called to repentance, and they will be accountable on the day, day of judgment for not repenting. Um, but nevertheless, my point is, right, that uh, I understand where somebody who's an unbeliever that, that's coming from. Sometimes people try to, you know, make people who are many times clearly not converted do a deliverance session with me, and they're like, I don't admit that I have this problem, just like, you know, you could tell that they don't even really want to be there. And I'm like, hey, uh, I can't blame you. Like, if, if you don't see that you have this problem, then why would you utterly be convinced by somebody to try to have deliverance done on you? I'm not going to utterly try to convince you that you need deliverance when you don't even have that foundational understanding from God. Once again, I'll still tell the truth to them. I'll preach repentance. I'll preach the gospel for sure. And at the end of the con you know, at the end of the conversation, I'll tell them the gospel. But nevertheless, I hope you guys get the distinction, right? I'm not holding them to the same standard as a, as a as a Christian. And I'm not thinking that just because their Christian family member brought them here 
that that means that they're ready for deliverance or something like that, right? Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, Can two walk together lest they be in agreement? Can two, two cannot walk together. You cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, obviously, that's primarily in the context of having an active relationship with somebody who's an unbeliever who's sinning and partaking in their sin. But even in a idea sense, right? Like if there isn't that openness to God to change and they're not heading in this, how can I walk? How can they walk in that path unless God is the one who intervenes and takes them out of the miry clay and places them upon a solid rock and establishes their going. So I'm not saying, therefore, we do nothing. I'm saying, therefore, we take a different approach. I'm saying, therefore, we rather show the love of God to them. We rather intercede and pray on their behalf. And yes, I know I just read a scripture in Jeremiah, but I'm just, I was just trying to get a point across with, there, there's some severe cases where the Lord's saying, no, don't minister to that person. But nevertheless, you know, I'm not saying, therefore, we don't minister to unbelievers. I'm just saying, you know, many times as well, too, you could try to work with unbelievers. You could try to hold them to a certain standard that you think a Christian might be held to. And they're going to end up resenting you. They're going to end up being bitter towards you and looking at you as you're trying to control them, right? And in and, and some sense, I understand where they're coming from. Because why are you trying to hold them to that standard? You should just break off the relationship if it's not working out. Don't try to change them, but rather just go your separate ways altogether is what you need to do sometimes, right? That can be the more loving thing. To, that can be the more loving thing to do, the more impactful thing to do. That can be the thing that causes them less unnecessary offense, right? Is to just have a conversation with them and be like, hey, I'm a born-again Christian, and this is how I live my life. I understand that you are not a born-again Christian. I understand that you're living in, in the way that you currently are right now. I understand that. And I just don't think this relationship is working out between us. I just don't think it's going to be good for us to continue on in this agreement, whatever it might be, right? And I'm not saying you have to inherently do this, but sometimes this, it, re it really is the wiser choice with people who aren't saved, with people who aren't repentant, is to just have a discussion with uh, with them like that, right? Like, I see we're clearly foundationally on different pages, so therefore, why are we trying to kick against the pricks? Why are we trying to, you know, be yoked with each other when we're headed in two different opposite directions? And it's going to take a lot of burden off of you, and it's also going to you know, not make them uh, feel as though you're trying to be so dumb and, and trying to change them so much. You know what I mean? And we do want to see that change, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by them becoming converted, right? That's the emphasis that we want to put up. You know, a lot of people here, thank you, Lord, for bringing this up. A lot of people initially try to lead somebody to repentance, lead to somebody to salvation, right? that they want to be friends with or they want to keep hanging out with in their family. But they get impatient. They don't trust God's timing for that person to get saved. So therefore, they just kind of let go of that and just start heaping Christian burdens on them, heaping Christian expectations on them instead, right? But you shouldn't be impatient and forsake that approach of wanting to see them saved. So I hope you guys can see that the message I'm preaching actually is a, a foundationally better approach. It's approach that puts more emphasis on them being led to salvation. And then everything comes into place, guys. Everything falls into place once somebody gets saved. You don't got to try and change somebody. You don't got to, you, in some sense, you don't got to do nothing once somebody becomes saved, right? That should be the ultimate emphasis you know, once that foundation is laid good, then everything can be built up from there. But you cannot build on a bad foundation. There's nothing good that will last building upon a, a, a bad foundation. So once again, I just want to encourage you guys in that. Maybe some of you, you've been continually getting frustrated in a relationship with somebody who won't repent. You've been continually getting stressed out and trying to change somebody who's not saved. You know, and you're in a relationship with them 
or your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or, you know, your family member or something like that. It's better to just have that conversation like, hey, I clearly see that you're not at the point where you're ready to follow biblical protocol, but me as a Christian, I need to live my life this way. So I think it would be better, you know, if we, if we head in different directions. And that doesn't mean you cut people off. That doesn't mean you're a Pharisee. That doesn't mean that you just burn all your bridges. No, it's not of God to isolate yourself and burn all of your bridges. But I think I've uh, dialed in on the situation enough for you guys to make the distinction and clearly identify what I'm talking about. Okay? So I hope that you guys were blessed by this video in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, let go of that control, guys. Um, this is a big that this is a big problem that many people deal with that you can't initially see once you're saved is that you're trying to control your you're trying to project into people still you're trying to control people and it can be even harder to discern sometimes when you're a Christian because you have these seemingly righteous intentions of trying to do godly things in people's lives and I believe God God will use it. You know, God's going to use the seeds that you sown, right? But when you know a more excellent way, you should take the more excellent way, right? So God bless you guys in Jesus Christ's name. I'll talk to you guys next time, all right? Bye.